Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. Sitting here with the rather wonderful Mr. Joe Ciccarelli. How are you? Good. Great to see you again. It's lovely to be seen. And here we are sitting in... In my, my second home, Sunset Sound, Studio One. Here we are. I've been in here so many times, <laughs> yes. immediately after you. And thank you always for leaving your rack here. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that I use it, but I do. I would hope you use it. That's why it's there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is a heck of a rack. You know, I, I always meant to say to you, I'm a huge Jeff Daking fan. I love those compressors. They kind of do, um, you know, a lot of different things. They can kind of be a 33609. Mm -hmm. They can kind of be an 1176. They're pretty unique. I use them on drum room, piano. They're pretty great. Acoustic guitar. Yeah. He's a great guy. He came down to the He's Aerosmith session. He was the drummer in the Blues Magoon. I know, in the 60s. I know, I know. So, yeah, I mean, when I first met him, he told me that. I was like, you were? <laughs> I mean, he's like, talk about well-rounded. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. I mean, like New York's like challenge for like blues at that right. time. You know, we had all the British blues bands and they were like the American version. Yep. Incredible. He's really a great uh, inventor. He, in fact, he's got a newer version of that that I'm actually really looking to hear as well. I think it's called a FET3, maybe something like that. You know the thing where when you're tracking and yeah. you get your balances and it all mm -hmm. feels great, then you spend the next two months overdubbing? Sure. And you can never get the track to feel exactly like it felt when you tracked because you've now got overdubs that are pushing and pulling a little bit yeah. and taking up frequency, frequencies that the drums took up, et cetera, et cetera. All the stuff Bob mixed for me, the mix felt like it felt on the tracking day. He was somehow able to really channel the energy like the best energy of the track and put the overdubs in their place but you know make it sound That's like amazing. the track and the, you know he's like he's a freak he really is when you look yeah. at what he's he's done on the console you're kind of like <laughs> uh, it's like al schmidt you know it's like are you, are you actually doing anything he's the only guy that has said this phrase and i mean that for everybody and i mean yeah. this in a loving way who has said this phrase i'm about to repeat that i actually trust he said to me he looked at me he goes i never solo but yeah, I believe him. Hmm. Because what you're describing, he just listens to everything in yes. context. It's it's all a piece of a puzzle. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So when he said it to me, I was like, I believe you. Well, I I, <laughs> I never solo when I mix, but oh, when okay. I track, I'll solo a lot. Right. But it's very rare that I'll just. I would never just work on the kick drum. I haven't done that since I started making records. You know. When you record. You record like you want to hear it. We, we, yes. when, we, when we were in uh, Nashville, we did that panel together. Yes, yes. That was one of the things. It's like you, you told me, you said you came out of, uh, at a time where it was records were being made by three or four different engineers. So you wanted to pass your work on and make sure the next guy that pulled up the faders was like, whoa. That's right. You wanted to impress. Oh, and also you had to, to impress the producer because the producer, when he walked in the control room, expected it to sound like it was a finished record. It was on the radio, you know? Mm -hmm. So you had to get all your sounds. So to this day, that's kind of how I work. And, and to make a good segue here, that's kind of what the presets are, is yep. really, you know, how I would track or how I would, you know, have a bass chain when I mixed or whatever. It's really like, getting it to the finish zone as quick as possible. Because seriously, if you had a, a producer who was the guitar player out on the session and you know you had to make it sound like a record in here, because when he walked in the room for a playback, he expected it sounded like you know it was on the radio. I've come in here to do sessions in this room yeah. after you've been in the day before tracking. Tracks. And every, there's a thousand patch chords in and no, 15 no, no. compressors. <laughs> and yes, that's true. No, there, <laughs> there usually is. There should be. There is. But like, I remember like looking at your, your, your 550 on, on a kick and it was like choo, 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 with, with EQ settings, just like committed. Like, this is the sound yeah. of my kick. There's a definitely a mentality, I think, at the moment of just kind of put the mic in front of it and then figure it out later. It's yeah. not the world that you came no, up with. No, not at all, no. And plus, you know, a lot of it was I trained under guys like Roy Thomas Baker and Jeff Emmerich and Ken Scott. Wow, wow, and wow. And guys that, you know, <laughs> the, the British sensibility at that time was much more aggressive and it was much more tweaking and sculpting stuff. So, you know, Roy, Roy was not afraid to, to put 
three compressors in, in a line or whatever it took. You just did what it took to get the sound that you were after. It didn't matter what the piece of gear was. There was kind of, you know, no real rule where the American way of making records was a lot more sort of by the book. It was safer. Al and Elliot and George and, you know, I love those guys. They make incredible records, but it was a very, very different approach, you know. Working on four, eight, 16, or even 24 tracks, which you and I used to think was a luxury. Yes. Now, of course, it's like, yes. oh, we've got unlimited tracks now. That's right. But even with 24 tracks, and Roy's a great example because with working with Queen, we've got like 16 harmonies on one side and 16 on the other. That, those have got to be recorded and then bounced together. Yes. So he's having to commit. Yep. With Roy, everything was committed. In fact, you know, uh, I worked on a Journey album with him, and all the guitars, and I mean like solos, rhythm tracks, everything was like quadrupled. It was on his 40 track machine. 40. So, yes, 40 track, two inch Stevens tape machine. Stevens. And so a lot of those guitars would have been bounced down, and it may have had a four tracks of a solo guitar and bounced it and yeah it was and you know the interesting thing about that mentality of committing to a sound and making it part of the framework of the record is you then build the rest of the record around that you know it's sort of like building a house where you know you got one thing here then everything else has got to click in place and work with it. So, you know, once you commit to that guitar sound, so then any other overdubs kind of got to work with that. So as opposed to what you're saying of like, okay, this is a good, nice, clear, neutral, clean sound. I'll put that down and here's another nice, mm -hmm. neutral, clear sound. Put that down and you hope that they all work together later. <laughs> yeah. You know? So in designing the plugin, that's the mentality you came up with. That's absolutely the mentality of like this is for a heavy rock drum sound this is what i'm going for for a pop sound this is kind of what i'm going for and of course you know presets are always tough because it depends on what's being put into it obviously and you know that I, I was kind of even reluctant to do this to begin with but over the years, I've done presets for many, many other manufacturers, and I can't tell you the people that have come to me and said, hey, you know, I used your preset on, and I used your preset, and it was really good. And I was like, really? You actually, you got something out of it? It actually worked? And he was like, oh, yeah, that's my starting point. I always use that. So when Robin and from Leapwing and I talked about doing this, I was like... Yeah, okay. I think it's right. I think the time is right for this. This is this is great. So yes, it's very much kind of my philosophy about how I would build a rock drum sound or a bass sound or a vocal sound, whatever the the preset is. Can you give us an idea of what pieces of equipment you use to sculpt this? Pretty much everything you see in the room. And I mean everything. <laughs> I <believe. laughs> no, it's uh, you know, Poltex, API EQs, 1176s, Chandler curve benders. Um, you know, we're, we're lucky we're here at Sunset Sound with, with their console, which is a very unique Incredible. API, yeah. Domidio. It's kind of a combination of a lot of different things. So that's there. Would have been a, you know, DBX limiter on the bass chain and a couple of different vocal limiters, whether it's a 1176 or a retro or whatever. So, I mean, I do change things up. In fact, the guys and I were talking earlier before you got here about that thing of like, do you leave the gear set mm -hmm. one way and just tweak it a little bit? And I always start from scratch. Even if I use maybe the same thing on a bass chain, it's always like, you know, it's different for every bass, different for every player. It's just, you know, different day. Plus it's fun. Yes, exactly. It's a joy. You get to yes. get in there and do some tactile stuff. Yes. And, and, and like I say, it is craft. putting together a house. It's kind of like, okay, for this record, I want my bass to sit here. And for this one, I want it to be more mid-rangey. So, you know, you really are building everything around those tones. Now, that's tracking. Now, but for mixing, do you have go-to places that you, you start with? Um, yes and no. Um, I say this because you committed so much to the sound anyway to tape, well, to, to DAW. Is there a certain thing that you know you're always going to do? The thing I know that I'm always going to do mm -hmm. is parallels. 
Okay. So the one thing that is contained in the plugin is a lot of different parallels, and that is for drums, bass, guitars. I mean, I'm I'm most always using them to some degree. Um, you know, drums might have three or four different compressors. Vocal might have three or four different compressors. Bass might have one or two. Guitars might have a couple of different ones. So, you know, things are, are, are stacked and, you know, everything has a, a different flavor. And that's one thing I've always loved about analog gear is that every piece of equipment really has a different character and a different timbre. And it also has a different character depending on how hard you hit it mm -hmm. or how cold you hit it. So, you know, as you know, you've worked with all this gear for such a long time. You know, if I treat my LA-2A in this very gentle way, it gives me this kind of sound. But if I push it more, then I get a bit more juice and grit. And it's a little darker and all. So you kind of get to learn those things over the years and know when you're kind of going for a sound that, if, okay, if I want something darker, I push this piece of gear like this. Um, so there's that, there's that philosophy within each preset. And the other th nice thing that we did, in fact, it's, honestly, it was kind of almost a surprise feature to me, is that, you know, as you know, depending on how hard you hit an analog console, it truly changes the sound. Absolutely. And, you know, you can be very clean and gentle with it if you were doing a jazz record or if you really want that compression and saturation, you push it and hit it harder. And we model the line trims here uh, on the Sunset console. And they're very unique uh, in the way they work, the preamp and the line gain. And the color really changes, you know, depending on how you work it. But, you know, because you can do so many interesting things in digital now, Leaping was able to take the character that the line gain has and then mod it within the plugin to even be a little bit more dramatic. So as you push the line gain, you get a more saturated, juicy color, and as you back it off, it opens up. And it's it's a pretty great, I, really, I, I actually got hooked on using the plugin just for the drive feature of it, because it's just such a unique character. I suppose that's the obvious question, and that probably everybody watching this is thinking, do you use your own plugin? I actually do, you know. Uh, it's funny. Not always, because sometimes, like you say, I, I like the challenge of building it, of putting a few plugins and moving them around and using them differently. But occasionally, I'll kind of go, I know exactly what this needs, you know? And I'll go to my kick drum preset and start from there. And the thing that uh, we were able to do within the plugin is you still have a lot of variability. It's There's almost like a, there's a API-ish graphic EQ in the plugin. Uh, there's a pull tech in the plugin. So you, you have a lot of options in terms of where you can go with it. So you can use it as your starting point and go from there. And that's the one thing I hoped, uh, you know, for a lot of people first starting out, they get great sounds, but as you know, it takes you a while when you're first learning. And over the years, like I say, you build up this knowledge and you can kind of go really quickly and go, okay, let's patch this in, patch this in, and you, you get to where you want in five minutes. But when you're first starting, you don't have that ability. So I really wanted this to be something that somebody could pop in, quickly get something that is a great starting point for them to build upon. Great, so we're actually going to go to Joe demonstrating the plugin for us. Okay, let's hear the plugin on guitar. We have a kind of intro groove guitar here that starts the song out. Let's see if we can toughen it up a little bit. We'll try a couple of these presets. I'm going to try rhythm guitar first. Already that's pretty respectable. Maybe it can be fattened up just a little bit. There we go. A little bit 
more lower mid, a little throatier sounding. We can even drive it a taste harder. That's a way to start a song. We can even go further and let's look in the presets here. Let's try heavy guitar. compressors that you can add a little bit more power and punch and an optical LA3A style that's a pretty respectable guitar tone Okay, let's try this on a clean guitar. We have a muted guitar here that plays in the outro of the song. Nice, tight, little muted part. Feels like it's a little skinny to me. Could use some weight. Let's hear that in bypass. Okay, and I'm gonna select the Lush guitar preset from my electric guitar here. And we can fill that out. And I think what I'm going to do is try to get a little more sustain in that. So I'm going to turn up one of these compressors. There we go. Now the notes are starting to sound a little longer, a little less muted. They have a little bit more weight to them. Maybe I can even try just a taste of console drive. So there's a lot of options within each preset. Let's just hear it in bypass again. There we go. There's some weight and size to it now. Thanks, Joe. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, man. This was always good to see you. Always good to see you here at home. <laughs> yeah, I love this place. So you can enter to win one of three copies of Joe's plugin. There's a link down below here. Just click the link. It's a raffle. So the more things you do to enter, the more entries you get. And oh, and just remember there, we do not give away praises and stuff on Telegram. So if you see any of those scams, it is not us. Thanks, everybody. So long, farewell, au revoir, au revoir, adios, ciao, goodbye. See you later. <laughs> <laughs>